Okay, so we saw the structure, the tree structure, who's responsible for what. I gave you a first look into the DNS database. What are the entries? And now what is missing? Well, we need a protocol that somehow exchanges this data. And the protocol is simple, which is a good idea. We already saw that we have a resolver on the host. So resolver software, if you have a browser, your browser, so the browser here will ask, uh, I need an IP address for a certain name. Then the resolver software does the job. So you have your resolution process and you send your query to your local DNS server configured via DHCP, you get a list of DNS servers. Or you configure it yourself if you want. So, and then everything goes via Google and Google knows exactly what you're looking for. So that's also a business model. Okay, your local DNS server, usually that's, well, <laughs> close to your end host. So uh, maybe from your uh, ISP or whatever, and you can configure this by hand, as I said, or dynamically DHCP. So what do you exchange? There's a very simple protocol with a single packet format. The packet format is used both for inquiries and responses. And the protocol, it all runs over a well-known port. So if you send a query, it goes to port 53. If you're unsure what a port is, go back to the bachelor lectures where we discussed socket, socket programming, ports, and all this stuff. So that's our DNS request. And basically, it contains an identification. So you have to match request and respond. Then we have a lot of flags telling you was this a request, was this a response. Is the response authoritative, non-authoritative? They go iterative, recursive, etc., etc., etc. And then we have numbers telling us, okay, how many well questions do we have? How many answers do we have, etc.? Is there some additional information? So very simple. The questions are exactly the names to be resolved, so we can ask for several names. The answers are then the resource records. You saw the examples for resource records, the answers to the previous inquiry. And then uh, we can also say, okay, um, please go to this and that name server. I don't have the answer, but this and that name server, you can ask those and you will get some, maybe some further data, etc. So that is the basic idea. And you can look up all these things, just check the RFC and you see it's a older RFC. So the phone book is there for a while. Sure, we have a lot of caching going on. I will come back to the caching in a second. So that's the basic idea. We use for these requests, the simple UDP. Okay. What does it tell us? UDP, it's non-reliable. That means such a request can get lost. Hmm, okay. But what is the solution? We implement reliability by simply repeating requests. So if I don't get an answer within a certain time, I simply repeat the request. So it's very simple. There are some more, some more uh, versions, DNS over HTTPS later in this lecture. Also how to secure DNS later in the lecture. So that's the simple scheme. Use UDP, use port 53, well-known port, send your query, get the reply. So that's the idea. And if you lose a request, simply repeat it. So that helps for reliability. Then we have to do something for performance. And if we need performance in computer science, we go for caches. Caching is the major technique 
for performance improvement. We know this from our processors, computer architecture, as well as here. So, as soon as I get an answer, I cache the answer. That helps a lot. Caches are cheap. They offload a lot of traffic. So again, our question from the example, we ask, the name server knows nothing. Then we do this game of asking, etc. In this case, we already have the answer here. We cache it. That means after giving the answer, if again the resolver asks for this, well, this goes to the cache and I get back the cached response. So that is simple, that's fast. Well, you have to check the cache, but that's much faster than asking external servers because um, you have the delay, uh, you have you know, two-thirds speed of light, etc. remote servers. This takes longer. Plus, there's also a cache on the client. So, typically, in most cases, and this is, I would say, the vast majority of answers you will get from your own computer directly because you have your cache here. So, what happens if you surf on a web page? You basically need the IP address a thousand times and more for a simple web page. So you will not go to a name server. You have a local cache and you directly ask the cache on your client. So caching is a cool idea, but as always, it's not for free. It's not the problem of cost, whatever, but what happens if you cache a response, but the world has changed. So what happens if the entries are not correct anymore? So that, that's, that's a problem. How do I detect this stale entries? When my cache is full, which entries to erase? So the classical uh, questions of, of caching, we know this from computer architecture. How long do I store entries? So the problem is that I've got something on my local cache and I think whatever this computer is mapped to this address. Okay, but what happens if now someone says, okay, this computer has now a complete different address. You still have this entry in your local cache. So the primary master already has a complete different entry, but you and your cache have different entry, plus all the intermediate name server that cached the old entry. They have wrong entries. And this is why we have the TTL. So those cache entries will be killed after a certain time. But we also saw this can be one day. So this is one of the reasons why it takes quite long. It can be up to two days before a change in the mapping is really well distributed all over the world. So that's one of the problems. Then there are some more issues, security issues, cache poisoning. So there are certain techniques uh, that can insert wrong entries into your cache. That means you have an inconsistency between your cache and the primary master. And this is used, for example, by governments to redirect you to other servers. So if you do not want your population to access this computer watching movies, you basically give them wrong DNS information, wrong information, so that the name servers you ask claim that they have an updated and correct information, and all your hosts will think, okay, perfect, this is now the address of uh, YouTube, but in reality, so asking the master, 
the address is whatever, something else. So that's a problem of using the caches. But on the other hand, we cannot always go to the primary masker getting authoritative answers. The point is you cannot trust non-authoritative answers. Hmm. Okay, so there are some security issues there. How do we handle the problem of these, well, cache entries living too long? There is dynamic DNS. Uh, there's an RFC for this. So uh, these are extensions that you say, okay, um, for example, with a DSL connection, you will get a new address every 24 hours. If you have a server at home, well, no one can contact the server because you have old cache entries. This means you register with dynamic DNS service and then you contact this service and you will always get the updated address. Uh, yeah. These are some additional solutions for good or bad. There are some security issues with that, etc. So you always see if you have a nice, simple, clean system, you add something, you run into some security issues. Okay, but there's also an RFC for that. We learned we can have some international characters, uh, character sets, so it's not ASCII only anymore. Plus we run into some issues there, for sure. So extensions are nice, but we have DNS sec, so there's also an RFC that uh, can guarantee you with the help of cryptographic signature, uh, is this really the server responsible for a certain domain? Because nowadays, as I said, okay, I can claim to be someone. I can fake many things. So we have now security mechanisms with DNSSEC that help us really to make sure that everything is fine, but it's not fully deployed. So we have compromises when it comes to backward compatibility. Security mechanisms also open new vulnerabilities. So we have to really take care how this is implemented, how this is used. Security mechanisms can be also heavy duty and then we can block them, etc., etc., etc. So there are some problems with that. There is something around spam defense. So uh, some extensions, etc., etc. So a lot more support. So you see, this is a wild, wild field. It's wild and wide, both. Okay. Still, DNS is the phone book. It's extremely important. And this is why really DNS has to be protected. And people do not play with it. So it's the most crucial indirection mechanism to access data. So if you control DS, uh, DNS responses, as I mentioned, you control the discovery of communication endpoints. And this is exactly what happened in many cases, what's heavily used by governments for many political motivations, there are also economical motivations, etc., that you cannot trust the name server, for example, of your internet service provider. If they are government control, then you cannot trust them. And one way out was uh, during the Arab Spring, for example, using DNS of Google, 8888. This was then immediately blocked so that you cannot connect to this. And, well, we have to think that if someone like Google, etc., provides a certain service, those companies make money out of this. Because if you control DNS, it's also interesting to see what the requests are because this tells you everything about the interests of all the users because you enter a name, a URL, the name resolution is done by a company, then the company knows what you're asking for. And this is money. So DNS has to be protected, but there are many problems around this. And one of the problems, it's not really a problem, is that in the very early ideas well, no one thought of all these political and economic interest. Because here it says one of the main ideas of the DNS is that everybody can get a chunk of the namespace. So that's our tree, part of it. Manage as they choose. That's perfect. And then it says you aren't supposed to lie about other parts of the namespace. 
where you can do in your own namespace whatever you like, but please don't lie about other parts. And this is exactly what is done if you ask a name server about whatever part of the tree. And this is not the name server's tree, but a cached entry. It could be right. It could be wrong. It's non-authoritative. So, well, if you must lie, lie only to yourself. That's one of the rules. So if you want to lie for whatever reasons, well, lying, it, there might be some good reasons why you uh, do not tell the truth about your own subtree. Please lie only to yourself, not to others. The problem is this guideline doesn't comply anymore with all the malicious activities in the Internet. So you see, we are now out of this pure technology right into the middle of economy politics. And also, if we look at a DNS and security, there's more later in this course. First, the basics. We see all these rot, uh, uh, red dots. We can attack many, many points in this game. So we can attack the cache on our own host. We can attack the request and response from the host to the name server. We can compromise the whole uh, these name servers. We can compromise whatever uh, generic uh, top-level domain. Oh, that's maybe a bit more complicated, but could be compromised the requests, etc. On the way to uh, the servers, root name servers. It's way more difficult to compromise. You see, it's not that simple. Okay, finally, two very simple tools for you to use. So quite powerful is the domain information groper or dig. So you dig for information. So you can try this and you will get exactly the information. For example, if you want to check out, so what do we know about web server from Google? Okay, then we will, uh, this is our question basically, tell me the address, I want to contact this one. Then the answer is not simple. The answer will be, okay, uh, Google basically check for www.l.google.com and l.google.com, well, um, who will tell you more about this domain? We have three name servers, just example. And in the end, we get two addresses, multi-homed. And then you can say, okay, I contact this one and we'll tell you some more. So it's quite powerful, uh, Dick. And there's also a very simple tool that was deprecated for some time, um, but you can use it. Um, not deprecated anymore. So uh, it's NS Lookup, name is Lookup, and you can simply ask something and you get an answer. And this is exactly where I see this non-authoritative uh, answer. And you see, okay, these are uh, the addresses. And it also tells you who answered this, okay. Can you trust this computer? Now we are back uh, to these attack ideas, etc. Okay, so some final questions. We learned we use UDP for DNS. It's unreliable. How do we implement reliability here? How do we achieve scalability? What's the major technique here? What do we use? We know this from computer science. This is fine, but what are the problems related with this technique? Uh, what else can we do to attack DNS? Please don't do it. Just you have to know how you can attack it. You know how uh, basically what the dangers are, what the threats are. Then please use DIG and SLOOKUP to get a better understanding. To check your favorite URLs and all these things. Check your own uh, university, big internet companies. And why do you quite often get these aliases as answers? You, you ask for servers and you get all these aliases. What was the idea of the aliases.